right, our next speaker this evening is Maddie Davis, and she is double majoring in biology and international studies. And she's been working with Dr. Byram in the Department of Biology on her bachelor's essay research. And the title of her project is Nuclear Transport Proteins and Early Embryogenesis. Maddie? Hello everyone, we're going to be switching gears a little bit now and talking about some biology. And so, like Dr. Meyer Bernstein said, my project is entitled Nuclear Transport Proteins and Early Embryogenesis, and I did that in collaboration with Dr. Bernstein Meyer. And we can get started. Um, so, to begin, you have to talk a little bit about what is nuclear transport and why is it important. So, some of you might remember from your basic biology class, we have this stuff called DNA. It's contained within the nucleus of our cell and it's the instructions for life. And in order to get to the DNA within our cell, there's actually this little membrane surrounding the DNA, and if you'll go to the next slide, um, there's these things called nuclear pore complexes, and they are able to kind of filter what can get to the DNA and what can't get to the DNA. So obviously this offers some protective properties because you don't want just anything um, interfering with what is going to be the instructions for life, right? So some things, if they're small enough, they can get by by themselves, but for example, something like this transcription factor, next slide, is too big, so it has to travel with what's called a nuclear transport protein. Next slide. Um, and so my lab studies something called an import, which is a class of these nuclear transport proteins. And um, they are able to facilitate this transport through the nuclear membrane so that um, the cargo molecule can interact with the DNA or do another function within the nucleus as well. Next slide. <coughs> so to begin, we're going to now talk a little bit about how this association happens. Um, so we have our import in our nuclear transport protein and a cargo molecule, the thing that needs to get into the nucleus, and it's going to be able to associate through what's called a nuclear localization signal. And so this is a 4 to 20 um, base or amino acid um, basic sequence, which are amino acids are just the basic um, monomer of a protein. It's what makes up a protein. And so the import is able to specifically recognize these um, sequences within a protein and they're specific. So different importants are going to be able to rec recognize specific proteins and facilitate their transport into the nucleus. Next slide for me. And so once this has been recognized, um, it's going to form a complex and then it's going to be able to pass through the nucleus. And once it's in or through the nuclear membrane, it can dissociate. So you're going to have your cargo, uh, this molecule, and then your important split in half and then your cargo can do its function and the important is going to end up out of the nucleus so it can repeat this process again. So for example, this one is a transcription factor, so it's going to interact with the DNA. Um, and so we study this in sea urchin and we use sea urchin as a model organism because it's a deuterostome. That means that it classifies the way that it developed, but it means for us that it's just, um, a little bit closely related to vertebrates. So the processes that we're studying in um, in sea urchin are pretty related to what we can see in ourselves. So the importance that we have are similar to the importance that the sea urchin have. So it's a very similar process. Additionally, they develop along three germ layers, which is the same way or similar to the way that we develop. So we have the endoderm, which is in yellow here. That's going to go on to form the gut of the sea urchin. The mesoderm, which is in red here. The shot is kind of hard, but it goes on to form the skeleton in the sea urchin and the ectoderm, which is in blue, and that's going to go on to kind of form the outer layer of the sea urchin. And next slide. Um, and so all of this, it's a pretty complex process, but it's regulated by what's called a gene regulatory network. And this is a series of transcription factors that kind of act like on and off switches to um, trigger these developmental events and make the cell that we all start out as into this complex organism that we develop into. And so I'm talking about these transcription factors, and they're one of the primary cargos that our nuclear transport proteins carry. Um, and so, like I said earlier, they're interacting with our DNA and kind of acting like an on and off switch so that some genes are being expressed, but not all the genes, because that would be a whole mess of things going on within one cell. And it allows cell phase specification. So that means it's going to have like a, um, it's going to make a cell different. So your heart cells are different than your skin cells because they have specific functions that they need to perform. Next slide. So we have these gene regulatory networks, and this looks super overwhelming, I know, but if you click next, you just have to remember it is a series of transcription factors. It is just uh, basically telling us how these on and off switches are working to create the development that we want to see. 
So this one specifically is the endometriderm network, telling us how the gut and how the skeleton is forming. And there's also one mapped for the ectoderm. And so this is another reason that we use sea urchin because it's very nicely mapped for us, which we really appreciate. And next. So our big question, going back to that, what role does these nuclear transport um, processes play in early embryogenesis? And so we have two approaches to doing this. So the first one is whole mountain seed chain hybridization, and that's a bit fancy word for saying we're studying when and where these um, nuclear transport proteins are acting within this urgen. So it's kind of hard to see on this light, but um, you, you might be able to see if there's a difference between this photo and this photo. Right here, um, the sea urchin is stained purple, and that means the gene that we were interested in is being expressed. So here it's expressed in the gut, but not expressed in the rest of the sea urchin. Um, and then we're also able to use sequence analysis to predict these nuclear localization signals that I was talking about earlier. And so, like I said, they're um, specific to different importance. So you might be able to say if you find this nuclear localization signal within this transcription factor, it might be carried by this nuclear transport protein. And we can go on. We're going to start with the whole mountain seed hybridization studies. So um, basically, whole mountain seed hybridization is a series of chemical reactions that's allowing us to determine when and where these um, genes that we're interested in are being um, expressed in the sea urchin. So what we see is we see a clear embryo go from clear to purple wherever the gene is being expressed. And so once we perform these really um, sensitive chemical reactions, to say the least, we're able to photograph them. And so we photograph 10 embryos from each trial. We repeat that three times to confirm the pattern that we're interested in. And then we choose a representative photo from each time point to, um, to signify that pattern. And so we're going to look at one of the genes that our lab has mapped and that I've worked on. This one is important 11. And you'll notice first um, that we have two different sets of photos here. We have what's called the anti-photo and the sense photo. The sense is serving as a control. Basically, it was exposed to what we call a probe that um, should not react within the sea urchin. And so this is telling us that the staining that we're seeing in the top photos is true and not as a result of some kind of background staining. Um, so we're going to go through this really quickly. Uh, we have the 12 hour stage on the leftmost, and that is our resin called bachelor. And you can see that the staining is pretty ubiquitous with that, with that or throughout. This means that it is present in all the different cells of the embryo, which means that it's probably involved in a pretty basic developmental process at that point. Moving on to the 14 hour early gastrula stage, it's high in the vegetal region, which is right here. It's where the gut is going to eventually form, and it gets a little bit lighter up here, so it could be involved in mesoderm differentiation, which we'll see a little bit later as well. Um, at the 16 hour um, stage, you can see we have pretty low expression. It's hard to see on this light again, but it's detected in the vegetal region a little bit, but still pretty low. Um, and there's a little bit of background staining on this embryo, so we're not entirely sure about this pattern specifically. And then at the 18 hour stage, um, this is a late gastrula, and you can see that again, we have this strong expression ubiquitously throughout the embryo, so it's involved in some kind of basic developmental process, most likely. Um, moving into the 22 hour stage, this is when it starts to get interesting. We see what's called differential expression. This means that it's being expressed in some of those germ layers, but not all the germ layers. So we see it in the mesoderm here in the gut that's forming. And you can see this is a side view and this is a top view. So you're looking here, um, right through there. So we see it expressed in the mesoderm, which means that it's likely involved in the gut differentiation. Next slide. And then at 36 hours, this is a huge jump, as you can see in the developmental time point. Um, but we now have what's called a cluteus stage. And so you have kind of the head of the embryo. This is a ciliary band, um, and which continues to the arms as well. And so here we see that it's expressed in the ciliary band, which goes on to form some of the um, neurodifferential cells within the sea urchin. But what's interesting is the ciliary band, like I said, continues through the arms, but it only is staining here and not in the arms further confirm this idea that perhaps it's involved in some nerve differential pathways. So here they all are all together, and if you'll go to the next slide, um, we actually were able to compare this to what's called transcriptomic data. This is more of a quantitative approach to understanding um, what um, or how much of the important level is being expressed. And so you can see the quantitative approach kind of matches the patterns that we were seeing as well, and the qualitative approach so we can see that there's high expression, it kind of goes down at the 16 hour stage, it goes back up, and then it decreases again as it becomes more um, differentially expressed. 
And so in other organisms, important 11 is involved in the WIT pathway. This is important for embryon, um, embryogenesis, cell polarity, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. But it has been implicated in the nuclear import of beta catenin, which is one of those transcription factors that we're interested in, and the localization of FISL2 in synoptic development, which is also something that we'll talk about. All right, and now the nuclear localization study. Now we're looking at how are these importance relating to the transcription factors that we're interested in. So we were able to look at these networks, sure. you're good, um, and pull all the different transcription factors from them. Basically, we just made a list. That's what we needed from this. And so next slide, um, I performed a metadata search from about 2000 papers. We looked for the 91 transcription factors involved in this developmental process and the 13 known importance within sea urchin. And from that, we were able to find about 25 associations. As an example, um, we looked at wind signaling. So here, this is involved in cell polarity, sulfate difference, or sulfate specification, neural patterning, and organogenesis, um, like I was talking about. And if you'll go to the next slide, we found that these different components were associated with the importance. So like we saw earlier, important 11 is carrying the frizzled and the beta catenin, as well as um, KPNB1 is carrying beta catenin and KPNA2, KPNB1, um, beta 1 is carried frizzled. And then this um, glycogen synthase kinase is being carried by transport 1. You might find it interesting that some of these are being carried by multiple um, importance, but this is actually advantageous in the long run because if one of these pathways um, for transport isn't working, you would not want these transcription factors to not end up in the nucleus, right? They have to be there to act for development. So that's why there's two pathways acting. Continue. And so here's a summary of the 25 associations that we did find, and we expected to find a lot more. So to continue this study, um, we actually decided to look for these nuclear localization signals within the transcription factors that we know of. Next slide. Um, so there are some existing databases that will do that for you, but they didn't work very well for our CR2 sequences. So we decided to create our own. So using the nuclear localization signals that we found, as well as what we know about nuclear localization signals, the fact that there are four to 20 base pairs, they're basic, um, and those sorts of things, we decided to start coding our own in Python. And so the goal is to create a parsing system. And so I was able to compile all of these nuclear localization signals and start to create a program. And this is something that's going to be taken up by a future student in the lab, um, someone with a little bit more computer science zeal than me. Um, and we hope that we'll be able to continue to identify these associations, which we can then compare to our whole mountain safety hybridization data to understand not only when and where they're acting, but also um, what they're carrying during those times. And so a big thank you to Dr. Byron for working with me for the past four years. Um, we have had a lot of fun working together and obviously I really enjoyed this project. Um, I am happy to take any questions now and I've been informed to say that the sea urchin is actually the king of the lock. I was just really impressed by this crab who climbed up on top of the sea urchin. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Nice job, Maddie. Um, any questions? You. Nick, anything from the chat? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah just um, you were saying that this is similar to like how humans work. Yeah. Um, so is there something specific that um, you're trying to kind of figure out to for a specific reason or anything for. Yeah, so um, basically what we understand about nuclear transport is that it's important again for things to be localized to the nucleus. And so if that pathway is broken, there could be a lot of different things. It's been implicated in cancer. It's been implicated viruses can actually use the, these nuclear transport um, pathways to invade their host and yeah. become more effective at that. So the better that we understand these pathways and um, the better that we can begin to diagnose diseases and those sorts of things, as well as, um, of course, looking at developmental processes. Specifically here, we have to understand how these transcription factors are getting to the nucleus so that development occurs correctly. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. So um, this has a human homolog, I'm assuming. Yes, it does. And, and so what do we know about that? Yeah, so we found that it's involved. Um, the beta catenin um, study was done in humans, so they found that important 11 is carrying beta catenin um, into the nucleus, which is a transcription factor involved in that WIT pathway that we were talking about. 
It's also been implicated in um, P10 nuclear localization, which is a key tumor suppressor gene. Um, and this is just important 11. There's 13 importants that um, are in sea urchin, and I believe there's 15 in human, if I remember correctly. Um, so these have, there's a pretty wide um, research base for what they're doing in human, I guess. And any mutational studies that have given you some insight as to a little bit more yeah. about its function? I, uh, as far as whose function? The uh, important 11 oh. function. Yeah, I mean, I know it's difficult in uh, sea urchins, but I'm right. thinking more about the mammalian from all over the. Right. I haven't encountered any yet, but I'm sure that they exist. Um, I know it's so when they're associating with this nuclear localization signal, obviously a mutation in that um, region of the important or that region of the nuclear localization signal would cause um, this location. Um, but I haven't encountered it in myself. Okay, awesome. All right, well, thanks, Benny. Nice job. Yeah, thank you.